Hello and welcome to the Short Story Workshop. In each episode, we read a short story and then discuss it. This week's story is The Monkey's Paw by W. W. Jacobs. Uh, this is a very famous story which you have probably seen reference to. You might already know it. Um, I think I saw it in like a TV show or reference to it somewhere before I read the actual story, but it's um, one of my favourites because of the classic storytelling device, The Monkey's Paw, which is... Uh, been used a lot in other stories and that's why i picked it so here is the monkey's paw by w w jacobs without the night was cold and wet but in the small parlor of laburnum villa the blinds were drawn and the fire burned brightly father and son were at chess the former who possessed ideas about the game involving radical chances putting his king into such sharp and unnecessary perils that it even provoked comment from the white-haired old lady knitting placidly by the fire hark at the wind said mr white who, having seen a fatal mistake after it was too late, was amiably desirous of preventing his son from seeing it. I'm listening, said the latter, grimly surveying the board as he stretched out his hand. Check. I should hardly think that he's come tonight, said his father, with his hand poised over the board. Mate, replied the son. That's the worst of living so far out, bawled Mr. White with sudden and unlooked-for violence. Of all the beastly, slushy, out-of-the-way places to live in, this is the worst. Paths are bog, the roads are torrent. I don't know what people are thinking about. I suppose because only two houses in the road are let, they think it doesn't matter. Never mind, dear, said his wife soothingly. Perhaps you'll win the next one. Mr. White looked up sharply, just in time to intercept a knowing glance between mother and son. The words died away on his lips and he hid a guilty grin in his thin grey beard. There he is, said Herbert White as the gate banged too loudly and heavy footsteps came toward the door. The old man rose with hospitable haste and opening the door was heard condoling with the new arrival. The new arrival also condoled with himself so that Mrs White said, Tut, tut, and coughed gently as her husband entered the room followed by a tall, burly man, beady of eye and rubicund of visage. Sergeant Major Morris, he said, introducing him. The sergeant major took hands and took the preferred seat by the fire, watching contentedly as his host got out whiskey and tumblers and stood a small copper kettle on the fire. At the third glass his eyes got brighter, and he began to talk, the little family circle regarding with eager interest this visitor from distant parts as he squared his broad shoulders in the chair and spoke of wild scenes and doughty deeds, of wars and plagues and strange peoples. Twenty-one years of it!' said Mr. White, nodding at his wife and son. When he went away, he was a slip of a youth in the warehouse. Now look at him. He don't look to have taken much harm, said Mrs. White politely. I'd like to go to India myself, said the old man. Just to look around a bit, you know. Better where you are, said the sergeant major, shaking his head. He put down the empty glass and, sighing softly, shook it again. I should like to see those old temples and fakirs and jugglers, said the old man. What was that you started telling me the other day about a monkey's paw or something, Boris? Nothing, said the soldier hastily. Leastways, nothing worth hearing. Monkey's paw? said Mrs. White curiously. Well, it's just a bit of what you might call magic, perhaps, said the sergeant major offhandedly. His three listeners leaned forward eagerly. The visitor absent-mindedly put his empty glass to his lips and then set it down again. His host filled it for him again. To look at, said the sergeant major, fumbling in his pocket. It's just an ordinary little paw, dried to a mummy. He took something out of his pocket and preferred it. Mrs. White drew back with a grimace, but her son, taking it, examined it curiously. And what is there special about it? inquired Mr. White as he took it from his son, and having examined it, placed it upon the table. It has a spell put on it by an old fakir, said the sergeant major. A very holy man. He wanted to show that fate ruled people's lives, and that those who interfered with it did so to their sorrow. He put a spell on it so that three separate men could each have three wishes from it. His manners were so impressive that his hearers were conscious that their light laughter had jarred somewhat. Well, why don't you have three, sir? said Herbert White cleverly. The soldier regarded him the way that middle age is wont to regard presumptuous youth. I have, he said quietly, and his blotchy face whitened. And did you really have the three wishes granted? asked Mrs. White. I did, said the sergeant major and his glass tapped against his strong teeth. And has anybody else wished? persisted the old lady. The first man had his three wishes, yes, was the reply. I don't know what the first two were, but the third was for death. That's how I got the poor, 
His tones were so grave that a hush fell upon the group. If you've had your three wishes, it's no good you now then, Morris, said the old man at last. What do you keep it for? The soldier shook his head. Fancy, I suppose, he said slowly. I did have some idea of selling it, but I don't think I will. It has caused me enough mischief already. Besides, people won't buy. They think it's a fairy tale, some of them. And those who do think anything of it want to try it first and pay me afterward. If you could have another three wishes, said the old man, eyeing him keenly, would you have them? I don't know, said the other. I don't know. He took the paw and dangling it between his forefinger and thumb, suddenly threw it upon the fire. White, with a slight cry, stooped down and snatched it off. Better let it burn, said the soldier solemnly. If you don't want it, Morris, said the other, give it to me. I won't, said his friend doggedly. I threw it on the fire. If you keep it, don't blame me for what happens. Pitch it on the fire like a sensible man. The other shook his head and examined his possession closely. How do you do it? he inquired. Hold it up in your right hand and wish aloud, said the sergeant major. But I warn you of the consequences. Sounds like the Arabian Nights, said Mrs. White, as she rose and began to set the supper. Don't you think you might wish for four pairs of hands for me? Her husband drew the talisman from his pocket, and all three burst into laughter as the sergeant major, with a look of alarm on his face, caught him by the arm. If you must wish, he said gruffly, wish for something sensible. Mr. White dropped it back in his pocket, and placing chairs, motioned his friend to the table. In the business of supper, the talisman was partly forgotten, and afterward the three sat listening in an enthralled fashion to a second instalment of the soldier's adventures in India. If the tale about the monkey's paw is no more truthful than those he has been telling us, said Herbert, as the door closed behind their guest, just in time to catch the last train, we shan't make much out of it. Did you give anything for it? inquired Mrs. White, regarding her husband closely. A trifle! said he, colouring slightly. He didn't want it, but I made him take it, and he pressed me again to throw it away. Likely, said Herbert, with pretended horror. Why, we're going to be rich and famous and happy. We should be an emperor, father, to begin with. Then you can't be henpecked. He darted around the table, pursued by the maligned Mrs. White armed with an antimacassar. Mr. White took the paw from his pocket and eyed it dubiously. I don't know what to wish for, and that's a fact, he said slowly. It seems to me I've got all I want. If you only cleared the house, you'd be quite happy, wouldn't you? Said Herbert, with his hand on his shoulder. Well, wish for two hundred pounds, then. That'll just do it. His father, smiling shamefacedly at his own credulity, held up the talisman as his son, with a solemn face, somewhat marred by a wink at his mother, sat down and struck a few impressive chords. I wish for two hundred pounds, said the old man distinctly. A fine crash from the piano greeted his words, interrupted by a shuddering cry from the old man. His wife and son ran toward him. It moved, he cried, with a glance of disgust at the object as it lay on the floor. As I wished, it twisted in my hand like a snake. Well, I don't see the money, said his son, as he picked it up and placed it on the table. And I bet I never shall. It must have been your fancy, said his wife, regarding him anxiously. He shook his head. Never mind, though, there's... No harm done, but it gave me a shock all the same. They sat down by the fire again while the two men finished their pipes. Outside, the wind was higher than ever, as the old man started nervously at the sound of a door banging upstairs. A silence unusual and depressing settled on all three, which lasted until the old couple rose to retire for the rest of the night. I expect you'll find the cash tied up in a big bag in the middle of your bed, said Herbert as he bade them good night. And something horrible squatting on top of your wardrobe watching you as you pocket your ill-gotten gains. He sat alone in the darkness, gazing at the dying fire and seeing faces in it. The last was so horrible and so simian that he gazed at it in amazement. It got so vivid that, with a little uneasy laugh, he felt on the table for a glass containing a little water to throw over it. His hand grasped the monkey's paw, and with a little shiver, he wiped his hand on his coat and went up to bed. In the brightness of the wintry sun next morning, as it streamed over the breakfast table, he laughed at his fears. There was an air of prosaic wholesomeness about the room which it had lacked on the previous night, and the dirty, shriveled little paw was pitched on the sideboard with a carelessness which betokened no great belief in its virtues. I suppose all old soldiers are the same, said Mrs. White. The idea of our listening to such nonsense. How could wishes be granted in these days? And if they could, how could two hundred pounds hurt you? 
might drop on his head from the sky, said the frivolous Herbert. Morris said that the things happened so naturally, said his father, that you might, if you so wished, attribute it to coincidence. Well, don't break into the money before I come back, said Herbert as he rose from the table. I'm afraid it will turn you into a mean, avaricious man and we shall have to disown you. His mother laughed and, following him to the door, watched him down the road, and returning to the breakfast table, was very happy at the expense of her husband's credulity, all of which did not prevent her from scurrying to the door at the postman's knock, nor prevent her from referring somewhat shortly to retired sergeant majors of bibulous habits when she found that the post brought a tailor's bill. Herbert will have some more of his funny remarks, I expect, when he comes home, she said as they sat at dinner. I dare say, said Mr White, pouring himself out some beer, but for all that, the thing moved in my hand, that I'll swear to. You thought it did, said the old lady soothingly. I say it did, replied the other. There was no thought about it, I just... What's the matter? His wife made no reply. She was watching the mysterious movements of a man outside who, peering in an undecided fashion at the house, appeared to be trying to make up his mind to enter. The mental connection with the two hundred pounds, she noticed that the stranger was well dressed and wore a silk hat of glossy newness. Three times he paused at the gate and then walked on again. The fourth time he stood with his hand upon it and then with a sudden resolution flung it open and walked up the path. Mrs. White at the same moment placed her hands behind her and hurriedly unfastening the strings of her apron, put that useful article of apparel beneath the cushion of her chair. She brought the stranger, who seemed ill at ease, into the room. He gazed at her furtively and listened in a preoccupied fashion as the old lady apologised for the appearance of her room and her husband's coat, a garment which she usually reserved for the garden. She then waited as patiently as her sex would permit for him to broach his business, but he was at first strangely silent. I was asked to call, he said at last, and stooped and picked a piece of cotton from his trousers. I come from Moore and Meggins. The old lady started. Is anything the matter? she asked breathlessly. Has anything happened to Herbert? What is it? What is it? Her husband interposed. There, there, mother, he said hastily. Sit down, don't jump to conclusions. You've not brought bad news, I'm sure, sir. And eyed the other wistfully. I I'm sorry, began the visitor. Is he hurt? demanded the mother wildly. The visitor bowed in assent. Badly hurt, he said quietly. But he is not in any pain. Oh, thank God, said the old woman, clasping her hands. Thank God for that, thank... She broke off as the sinister meaning of the assurance dawned on her, and she saw the awful confirmation of her fears in the other's averted face. She caught her breath, and turning to her slower-witted husband, laid her trembling hand on his. There was a long silence. He... he was caught... in the machinery, said the visitor at length, in a low voice. Caught in the machinery, repeated Mr. White, in a dazed fashion. Yes. He sat staring out the window, and taking his wife's hand between his own, pressed it as he had been wont to do in their old courting days, nearly forty years before. He was... the only one left to us, he said, turning gently to the visitor. It is hard. The other coughed, and rising, walked slowly to the window. The firm wishes me to convey their sincere sympathy with you in your great loss, he said, without looking round. I beg that you will understand I am only their servant and merely obeying orders. There was no reply. The old woman's face was white, her eyes staring, and her breath inaudible. On the husband's face was a look such as his friend the sergeant might have carried into his first action. I was to say that Moore and Meggins disclaim all responsibility, continued the other. They admit no liability at all, but in consideration of your son's services, they wish to present you with a certain sum as compensation. Mr. White dropped his wife's hand, and rising to his feet, gazed with a look of horror at his visitor. His dry lips shaped the words, How much? Two hundred pounds, was the answer. Unconscious of his wife's shriek, the old man smiled faintly, put out his hands like a sightless man, and dropped a senseless heap to the floor. In the huge new cemetery, some two miles distant, the old people buried their dead and came back to the house steeped in shadows and silence. It was all over so quickly that at first they could hardly realise it and remained in a state of expectation as there was something else to happen, something else which was to lighten this load too heavy for old hearts to bear. But the days passed and expectations gave way to resignation, the hopeless resignation of the old, sometimes miscalled apathy. Sometimes they hardly exchanged a word, for now they had nothing to talk about, and their days were long to weariness. It was about a week after that the old man, waking suddenly in the night, stretched out his hand and found himself alone. The room was in darkness, 
and the sound of subdued weeping came from the window. He raised himself in bed and listened. Come back, he said tenderly. You will be cold. It is colder for my son, said the old woman and wept afresh. The sounds of her sobs died away on his ears. The bed was warm and his eyes heavy with sleep. He dozed fitfully and then slept until a sudden wild cry from his wife awoke him with a start. The paw, she cried wildly. The monkey's paw. He started up in alarm. Where? Where is it? What's the matter? She came stumbling across the room toward him. I want it, she said quietly. You've not destroyed it. It's in the parlour, on the bracket, he replied, marvelling. Why? She cried and laughed together, and bending over, kissed his cheek. I only just thought of it, she said hysterically. Why didn't I think of it before? Why didn't you think of it? Think of what? he questioned. The other two wishes, she replied rapidly. We've only had one. Was not that enough? he demanded fiercely. No, she cried triumphantly. We'll have one more. Go down and get it quickly, and wish our boy alive again. The man sat in bed and flung the bedclothes from his quaking limbs. Good God, you are mad, he cried aghast. Get it, she panted. Get it quickly and wish, oh, my boy, my boy. Her husband struck a match and lit the candle. Get back to bed, he said unsteadily. You, you don't know what you're saying. We had the first wish granted, said the old woman feverishly. Why not the second? Uh, coincidence, stammered the old man. Go get it and wish, cried his wife quivering with excitement. The old man turned and regarded her, and his voice shook. He has been dead ten days. Uh, besides, he, I would not tell you else, but I could only recognise him by his clothing. If he was too terrible for you to see then, how now? Bring him back, cried the old woman, and dragged him toward the door. Do you think I fear the child I have nursed? He went down in the darkness, and felt his way to the parlour, and then to the mantelpiece. The talisman was in its place, and a horrible fear that the unspoken wish might bring his mutilated son before him ere he could escape from the room seized upon him, and he caught his breath as he found out that he had lost the direction of the door. His brow cold with sweat, he felt his way round the table and groped along the wall until he found himself in the small passage with the unwholesome thing in his hand. Even his wife's face seemed changed as he entered the room. It was white and expectant, and to his fears seemed to have an unnatural look upon it. He was afraid of her. Wish, she cried in a strong voice. It is foolish and wicked, he faltered. Wish, repeated his wife. He raised his hand. I wish my son alive again. The talisman fell to the floor and he regarded it fearfully. Then he sank trembling into a chair as the old woman, with burning eyes, walked to the window and raised the blind. He sat until he was chilled with the cold, glancing occasionally at the figure of the old woman peering through the window. The candle end, which had burned below the rim of the china candlestick, was throwing pulsating shadows on the ceiling and walls, until with a flicker larger than the rest, it expired. The old man, with an unspeakable sense of relief at the failure of the talisman, crept back to his bed, and a minute afterward the old woman came silently and apathetically beside him. Neither spoke, but sat silently listening to the ticking of the clock. A stair creaked, and a squeaky mouse scurried noisily through the wall. The darkness was oppressive and after lying for some time screwing up his courage, he took the box of matches and striking one, went downstairs for a candle. At the foot of the stairs, the match went out, and he paused to strike another. And at the same moment, a knock came so quiet and stealthily as to be scarcely audible, sounding on the front door. The matches fell from his hand and spilled in the passage. He stood motionless, his breath suspended until the knock was repeated. Then he turned and fled swiftly back to his room and closed the door behind him. A third knock sounded through the house. What's that? cried the old woman, starting up. A rat, said the old man in shaking tones. A, a rat, it passed me on the stairs. His wife sat up in bed, listening. A loud knock resounded through the house. It's Herbert. She ran to the door, but her husband was before her, and catching her by the arm, held her tightly. What are you going to do? he whispered hoarsely. It's my boy, it's Herbert, she cried, struggling mechanically. I forgot it was two miles away. What are you holding me for? Let go, I must open the door. For God's sake, don't let it in, cried the old man, trembling. You're afraid of your own son, she cried, struggling. Let me go. I'm coming, Herbert, I'm coming. There was another knock, and another. The old woman, with a sudden wrench, broke free and ran from the room. Her husband followed to the landing, 
and called after her appealingly as she hurried downstairs. He heard the chain rattle back and the bolt drawn softly and swiftly from the socket, then the old woman's voice, strained and panting. The bolt! she cried loudly. Come down, I can't reach it! But her husband was on his hands and knees, groping wildly on the floor in search of the paw. If only he could find it before the thing outside got in. A perfect fusillade of knocks reverberated through the house, and he heard the scraping of a chair as his wife put it down in the passage against the door. He heard the creaking of the bolt as it came slowly back, and at the same moment he found the monkey's paw and frantically breathed his third and last wish. The knocking ceased suddenly, although the echoes of it were still in the house. He heard the chair drawn back and the door opened. A cold wind rushed up the staircase, and a long loud wail of disappointment and misery from his wife gave him the courage to run down to her side and then to the gate beyond. The street lamp flickering opposite shone on a quiet and deserted road. So, Snow, your thoughts on the story? I liked it, and I liked the ending. It didn't work out exactly how I thought it would, which was nice. And I like that you got such a sense of the family dynamics at the beginning with the little chess match going on. It's just a very warm scene, which I really enjoyed. Yeah, I was thinking about the chess match, actually, trying to think if um, there was some significance to it or whether it was just made to build the characters. I was like, is, is it showing the father laughing at fate because he's fated to lose the, the chess match? And I was like, you're thinking too hard, Mel. It's just to see about chess. It is a strategy game, isn't it? I thought it was to show that he's a bad loser. So when he then loses his son, he doesn't accept it very easily. Oh, I was just going to say that he draws the moths out rather than just admitting defeat. He's like trying to distract the son. Yeah, but I kind of viewed that as kind of friendly, isn't it? Like playful almost. So it kind of gave me a sense of like warmth and character. But there is the idea of like a strategy, isn't it? Like of like there's always a way to win even when you're losing, which would go against the idea of fate being something that you can't out trick. Like it's, fate isn't chess. Chess has a thousand different possibilities. No match will ever be the same, unlike fate, in which case, unless the idea is that you can play a thousand different ways, but the outcome will be the same. Makes sense. So I, I have to ask, if it didn't end how you thought it would end, then what did you think would happen? Pretty much the second he died, I knew that the wish, second wish was going to be about kind of bringing him back. I just kind of almost expected to see the monster or the terrible outcome, like the door opening, basically, rather than them wishing him gone before the door ever opened. But I like that we didn't see. Yeah, it's concealed the monster for an actually good reason. Yeah, and then you never quite know if it was actually him, and therefore you never know if it was all just coincidence or if the monkey's paw actually works as well. Exactly. Yeah, I do like that. Like, is this thing even magical? Like, there is evidence to suggest it is, but it is coincidental as well, or circumstantial. Also, as an object itself, it's just a bit weird. Why, why would you have just a monkey's paw? How did you come to have it? What happened to the what rest happened of the to monkey? the rest of the monkey? Well, it's like rabbit foot, isn't it? Yeah, but rabbit's feet are supposed to be lucky, not cursed. Mm. Maybe that's the idea. The opposite. What's the opposite of a rabbit? A monkey, obviously. <laughs> mm, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there is something about the whole like mysterious item from India, isn't there? Like, there are some themes of Orientalism. Is that the word I want? But then it's also challenging, isn't it? The idea of the person who's making the wishes. It's challenging their idea of desire and greed, which in that sense, does make sense within the colonial kind of context of you want these things, you took them, and now you're going to pay the price for it. So it's quite interesting as a symbol. I viewed it more as like a fear of things from foreign lands. Mm. I don't think of this spooky thing I brought back from India. Yeah. It's supposed to be lucky, but actually it just curses you. But then it only curses you if you make a wish and therefore try to challenge or want something for nothing, essentially, isn't it? Like, that's what a wish is. In these contexts. I love the part where it says the last owner wished to die or something like that. It really makes you think, what on earth happened to this guy? Pity me, be careful what you wish for. So yeah, we see the be careful what you wish for kind of device in so much fantasy fiction. Honestly, I've seen lots of TV show episodes around it. I've seen books, I've seen films. There's always backfiring spells, accidental curses. Do you think as a device it's ever going to get boring? Do you ever think there'll be a time where we get tempted by something magical and they're like, nah, we're too clever for this. <laughs> I think I'd find that annoyingly unhuman. 
Like, we always say that, like, oh, if I was in a horror movie, I'd be the clever one and I wouldn't go down into the creepy basement or whatever. But then it's the idea, isn't it, that, like, if something's going to trip you up or you've got this greed inside of you, it's going to get you regardless. Like, it's to do with your own driving forces so much less than the magical object itself. Like, the people who are going to be tricked by the monkey's paw will always be the kinds of people who are tricked by the monkey's paw. Would you feel almost cheated if, if they were just like, I think we'll just leave that there, bye. I think it could be played for some version of the story, but if you had a story where I think the characters were making purely rational decisions all the time and never driven by their desire or emotions, I think the character would quickly become dull after the first kind of gimmicky story, I suppose. Like, unless the whole idea is you can do everything right and it will still go wrong. Which I think is bleaker than, you know, someone mess- messing up, then having to fix the problem. I think you could get quite a nice contrast going on here on characters like, oh no, don't touch that, bad things will happen, and then you will really like, but, but I want a million pounds though, <laughs> which is kind of what happens in this story to some extent. I mean, it, if he didn't go along with it, then it serves no purpose in the story. I mean, you can do refusal to the call all you want, like, oh, I'm not doing this, I'm too smart, but it's got to be there for a reason. Like, they play with it a lot in The Matrix, but he still takes the red pill in the end. Yeah, like, something happens to force you into the story. Like, you can try and refuse, but, like, if we were actually reading a story where people just kind of dodged out the way of the danger, there wouldn't be a story there. Like, no one wants to read about people currently, like, living their quiet little life. You want your main character to stumble into danger. Yeah, otherwise you don't have a plot. And, like, I know you can make the argument of, like, some things aren't supposed to be about danger. Like, you know, the coffee shop AU, for example, is all about, like, you know, everything being nice and wholesome. But on the other hand, you're still expecting something to happen within the plot of that. There's so many dangers in coffee shops. You can scourge yourself. You can dr- drink too much hot chocolate and feel really sick. I don't. I don't think those are compelling plots. I hate no, to break they're it not. To, you. <laughs> to come back to your question now, I I think the wish giving device has been more or less exhausted in most cases. Like it's hard to do something original with that. I think. I mean, I guess you could be really self-aware of it, which I think is maybe what you were getting at, but... Disagree. You disagree? Example of a brilliant, based on a wish-giving story, maybe not the free wishes, but recently one I really enjoyed was The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue by um, the Swab. The premise is, again, someone makes a wish or a deal with some kind of force that and the wish backfires and your plot comes from that. I think it can't be used for short stories unless you're going to unpack or go a bit deeper to the consequences where it's not just about them making the wish but living with the wish or what happens after the wish is made but i think there's definitely still room for that premise to set up interesting stories where you have unusual circumstances because of the wish and then it's them dealing with their plot around whatever shenanigans are happening i suppose it's a really good way to explicitly show your character arc because you have your character wish for something and then as the story goes on they realize perhaps they were wrong even if like, what if they wish for something and they do get it and there's no obvious downside, but then getting it proves that they don't want it after all, or it's not what they thought it was, despite there not being anything actually overtly horrible. It's just, you know, the idea of, like, wanting something that you can't have or not realising that what you want isn't what you need or things like that. There's so much to play with, I think, with the wish-giving device still. So I would thoroughly disagree. Okay. No, that makes sense, actually. You've convinced me. I think in the way that this story uses it, where it's focused very much on the free wishes and the whole point of the plot is, oh, surprise, be careful what you wish for, is done because we all know that point, but I think there's more to it still. Like, we all know at this point that it's going to go badly. The point is, and then what? I think in this story as well, they use quite relatable wishes, whereas if you used it in a longer story, you could have the character wish for things that are more specific to their character and tell you, what they want and what what's driving them whereas in the story i think because it's short they go for like oh well everybody wants more money also because it was one of the first stories of its kind it's just where everybody starts really isn't it (laughs) like Mm. yeah money please (laughs) yeah it's like i think we talked about is there still a space for prophecy for example in stories and it's like i think it comes down to the same idea of yes but it's a premise it's not your whole story anymore yeah it's more about like thinking about what you're doing rather than just blindly using it as a device and doing the same thing that's been done a trillion times before. So I, when I was writing the questions, I was trying to think about how to approach the story and I realised I had this question of, I'm not sure if this is a fairy tale or a horror story. And then I was like, I think it's both. Uh, would you agree with that or what's your take on it? I would agree with that 100%. Let me tell you why it's a horror story. 
is my quick and dirty definition of horror. Horror is when something bad is coming and you know that it's coming. In this story, we see the father realizes how horribly wrong his second wish could possibly have gone when he brings his son back. And he knows it's going to be terrible and he knows it's coming. And when it knocks on the door, he knows what it is. And that's horror. As a contrast to a thriller where you don't really know what's going to happen next. And that's what makes it exciting. This is a very interesting definition. I would agree, which is why the whole genre of horror story inherently makes it horror because you spend the whole time waiting for something bad to happen, even if it's actually very nice and happy for the majority. Do you think people sometimes get too caught up on aesthetics when looking at a genre? So like, oh, is it take place at night? Are there like zombies or ghosts? Then it's horror. It's not really. Like horror is an emotion, right? The shock and the dismay and the fear. Jump scares, I think, have a place in horror, but even then, it's not so much that a surprise is it that the terrible thing turns up. So I think I would agree with your definition. Like, jump scares aren't, oh my god, there's a thing there, it's, oh god, when's the thing coming? Right, like, the jump scare is just to give you that kind of visceral kind of reaction immediately, which is kind of a step down from where actual horror is. Mm. I mean, Stephen King talks a lot about this in on writing, if you're one of the few people who likes writing and haven't read that book. I haven't read it. I have. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> one of the few. So would you say with horror, it's it should be a lingering feeling? Well, yeah, you, the, with horror, you often want to let your audience know what is about to happen, and it's going to be horrible in some way. Mm. I like the way you used thriller because I'm often confused about the difference between the two. Sometimes thriller is when you don't know. Yeah, thrillers are exciting because you don't know what's going to happen next, and I think suspense is somewhere in the middle, somewhere. <laughs> yeah, thrillers are all about the unpredictable and the twist and the tension, and the story kind of changes constantly. Yeah. Well, yeah, I see what you mean now. In the story, we know that this is freaking monkey's paw is going to cause some trouble. Exactly. We know that even before the second wish, like immediately they bash us over the head with the idea that this thing is bad, you shouldn't use it. And that is setting up the horror. Like you could have told the story from the point of the army man, but you didn't. Exactly. So in terms of the fairy tale elements then, things like three wishes. It has the repetitive structure. Yep. Hmm. Moral. Moral, yeah. But then I think there is a very similar line between horror and fairy tale in that originally a lot of fairy tale was meant to horrify. It was like the ghost stories you told around the fire. They were cautionary tales, which is kind of what horror is in a certain way. Yeah, I think that's true. Like Some of those grim stories are pretty nasty. They're pretty grim. And horror relies on a lot of the same tropes, doesn't it? Like if you, for example, in a fairy tale, you might often be punished for being a more promiscuous woman. In a horror movie, it's what you might often, well, it's famous, isn't it? You die if you sleep with someone in a horror movie and you're a woman. Like, there's a lot of similarity and crossover between the two, I think. Right, no, I think you might be interested in why. I think to punish the evil stepmother, they make her wear these shoes that feel like she's walking on hot pokers and then she dances to her death. Yes. That's why at some point you should stop dancing. <laughs> the shoes compel you, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so maybe these two kind of genres then sort of more naturally go together than maybe some others would. When you decide, hey, I think I want to blend some genres, where do you think you should start? And do you think, what can go wrong? <laughs> okay, okay, well, let's let's look at what you should think about to start with. I mean, we've talked a bit about fairy tales, horror. The thing is, these work together pretty well, and you need to identify the areas where the two genres do work together nicely. Like, Horror, you need to know something bad is coming. Fairy tales, you have this repetitive structure. Those just obviously go together, right? Mm. So you can capitalize on that, where these genres fit together. And so that's what the first job is to identify how they can complement each other. Yes. And there are some genres that just seem to sort of sit side by side. Like fantasy and romance, I think, is one. Horror and romance. Yeah, romance is like... It's a good undercore to everything because I think love can be portrayed in so many different ways as an emotion it's not like happiness it can be terrible and it can be beautiful and it can drive people to behave in very different ways so it's very easy to adapt although traditionally speaking romance requires a level of happiness but then that's also to do with understanding your genre and who's going to be reading you and what they want out of your story horror romance is admittedly often more tragic Uh, are the ones that go together like i think we've seen a few sci-fi westerns (laughs) Mm. Yes, those those kind of fit because you have the every man for himself kind of idea 
against the vast openness of space. It kind of just works. Mystery thriller works. Mystery romance. Yeah. Romance coming of age. Or... I think you can blend any genres, really. You mm. just need to do it right. So, what's the sign you're doing it wrong? <laughs> okay, this is the more difficult question. Mm. I think it's when you don't understand the genre you're working with. Like, it's when people put fantasy elements into a story, not necessarily without being fantasy writers, but where they've clearly never engaged with, like, a fantasy novel. And it, they're kind of acting like what they're doing is the, oh my god, no one's ever done this before, when actually it's a genre staple, and it's a lack of awareness of that, I think, can cause a story to crumple. Like, you need to be genre savvy of both your genres. Like, I think Machines Like Me by Ian McEwan was criticised for this. Can you explain why? From what I read, it was because... He was trying to tell a science, he was using quite a common science fiction concept. So when I picked up the story, I thought he was going to write it like a science fiction author. But I underestimated how literary Ian McEwan is, and I hated it. <laughs> right. So I think that's the key point here. Not only do you need to understand both genres, you need to understand the expectations of the readers you're going to get from each genre, because they might be different. And you need to satisfy both demands, basically, because... They pick up their book, they're expecting a certain kind of thing, they're expecting a certain payoff, and you have to deliver that at some point. I think as you get more into sub-genres, I think there is conflicting ones where I think it would be harder to get them to work together. Like, say, for example, realist literature has very specific point in like literary canon, and it's very much about this could happen in the real world. So I don't think that would fit with fantasy, for example. Like, you can do an urban fantasy, but that you wouldn't be able to describe it as a realist piece of literature would be magical realism at that point maybe yeah like it would change yeah. the genre are there any genres you think are more difficult to work with personal for the writer like personally historical is not for me but lots of people do very well with historical so it's not that it's inherently harder to work with is that because you have to do more research you know me and my settings <laughs> settings and research not my place let me throw, I'm going to put you on the spot now and ask you what your favourite genre blending book slash movie is, if you don't mind. Hmm. <laughs> uh, I'll go first if you want. I'm going to just throw Shaun of the Dead in there. I like the Zomcom. <laughs> Fair. That works really well because you have the incompetent characters from comedy, but you know they're going to mess it up so horribly. <laughs> <laughs> and they did. <laughs> and there's your horror. It just works, you see? You can just throw zombies at things, and it seems to pride and prejudice of zombies also seem to work quite well. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, uh, the, I love the movie Pride and Prejudice from Zombies. I don't think the book works as well, but the movie is one of my favourite Pride and Prejudice adaptations. Don't shoot me. He's one of the best Darcy's. <laughs> In terms of books, Deathless by Catherine M. Bellant, I think, is a wonderful blend of fantasy, historical, and romance. It's using fantasy to comment on real-life events. So it's like a real blend between like being in a fantasy world, commenting on the Russian Revolution, and then this kind of underpinning romance, which is driving kind of romance, which is underpinning the plot. Like, it's brilliant. Um, TV, I've recently loved The Haunting of Bly Manor, which I would consider a mixture between horror and romance. Well, that's an interesting mix. Mm, I love a horror romance done well. Crimson Peak by Guillaume de Terro, I also really liked. Pan's Labyrinth as a horror and Coming of Age works really well. What about you, Matt? Are you still drawing a blank? Yeah. You can't just throw these at me, man. You've got to give me time to I'm think sorry. about it. I'm sorry. I should have written it in my questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'm going to come back to uh, the, the sort of what we were talking about earlier. So the, 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 I guess the moral of this story is that you, you can't win against fate. You can try and change your fate and fate will be like, nope, I'm doubly screw you over. Now... This is a bit of a contrast for me because I play a lot of video games in which the purpose or the point of the story is that free will is a thing and you can defy fate. So I'm just really confused. I'm like, can I defy fate? Can I not? Will fate hurt me? <laughs> Do you have any thoughts on the message and why fate is such a common thing in stories? In this particular story, I found the fate thread almost a little strange. In the sense that it doesn't feel like there's anything in the story that's actually fated to me. Like, there's no sense of them trying to escape their fate and failing. Like, they're making decisions, and the decisions have reasonable outcomes, which you might expect. But that doesn't quite feel like fate to me. So the idea that the monkey's core is 
a fate to rule in people's lives feels strange. Like, was uh, it that the guy was always going to die in a in machinery accident? Was that kind of the point? Like, I don't know, it just didn't have a fate ring to me. It had a your actions have consequences kind of fate, and you can never get something for nothing what felt more like moral to me. I guess the idea is that they're interfering with the way that things should have been and therefore must be punished. Yeah, so they were diverging from the path that they were supposed to walk down. They tried to use the monkey's paw to cheat. And therefore were punished by fate. Yeah. See, to me, that very idea seems like I understand where you're coming from, and I think you're correct in your interpretation. But to me, if fate is something you can't ex- escape, to be punished by fate is almost weird because it suggests that your fate isn't stuck. Oh, I see. Yeah, it's not predetermined. So, yeah, for this to for this to make sense, the monkey's paw has to exist outside of fate somehow. Yeah. So I got a bit stuck on that you can't win against fate in this story. It's kind of a religious question, I guess, because it's basically saying, I mean, if you think there is fate, then you believe that there's a determined path, and maybe that makes some sense. But the idea that fate could then seek revenge on you does seem mm. a bit odd. It's like you, you need someone, something there that has agency, which is saying, no, you cannot do this, which almost feels like God, right? Well, it came from the idea that sometimes you have such a bad week, you feel like something up there is manipulating things against you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Like, they're laughing. We we have a tendency to kind of think of ourselves as living out a story and making connections, and we start saying, oh, why is everything going wrong? Oh, it must be preordained, or someone decided it should be this way. I think it's just something about the way that we think. Mm. Yeah, I think humans search for patterns, and if you're in a bad mood, you're noticing more bad things. So sometimes it really does feel like a lot of bad things happen at once, and there is no getting around that, but then that could just as easily be coincidental. Just really bad luck. Yeah, maybe a bit like maybe the monkey's paw is, as you were saying earlier. Like, fate might not be sentient. It might not care, which is probably the truth. <laughs> I know. As a story content, like, I love the idea of a vengeful fate, too. If you try to defy it, it will screw you over for the audacity in the sense, like, fate is something where you should be following my orders, but you're not. It's a wonderful antagonist, and I love it. But also, it's not goes against my traditional ideas of fate. Like, if you can't escape your fate, no matter what you do, you end up in the same spot. Yeah, this is not that um, yeah. circular, I guess, because they chose to make the wish. Because the story withholds the sun returning through the door, we don't actually know for sure if it would have turned out badly or we can suspect this from the first wish and the fact of, like, the context that the story is given us. But we don't actually know. It could have turned out fine. Mm, that's very true. In which case, this tragedy of the story is that it could have all been fine, but he wished against it. I don't know. Kind of like the idea of your creepy, recently dead son coming back because he made a wish. Mm. <laughs> it's just ugh, so horrible. <laughs> it is. Contrasts really nicely with the line earlier. Oh, he's not in any pain, right? Mm. Mm. Yeah. But then you really would be. <laughs> all right. Any other thoughts on the story or anything else you wanted to talk about? Should we talk about how insanely embedded in popular culture it has become <laughs> yeah <laughs> you probably should <laughs> i'd know but i love the dialogue in this okay i'm done with that i just wanted to note that i do really like the dialogue um yeah so for a start i think i read on the wiki that wonder woman 1984 is based around this yeah wish granting premise which... i watched it recently yeah yeah it came out last year didn't it yes so uh when did the original Monkey's Paw come out? 1880 80 something. And in uh, 2020, we're still telling the same story. <laughs> <laughs> Ish. But with Wonder Woman, because she's great. <laughs> There's been a lot of movies about it. Uh, it's often used in, like, Monster of the Week shows. I think, like, I can't remember which TV show I saw it in. I think it might have been Charmed, but it was a long time ago. Um, there have been a lot of different variations as well. There was an episode of Inside Number 9 on the BBC, which was inspired by the story as well. Very strange story. Like, one of the characters wishes for a rat to come back to life, and then it does, and that's kind of weird. That the monkey's poor item has got powers. Weird. Not sure how I felt about it, really. <laughs> Wasn't one of the best. It was okay. So it was the average episode. <laughs> hmm. but yeah, why, why do you think that we keep telling this story over and over again? Is it this central truth that we believe we can't really get what we want. There has to be some kind of catch to it. It's just a really powerful plot setup. 
especially because we know it's going to go wrong and we've kind of seen it before so you don't need to explain it like we know how this goes means you can do a lot with it quite quickly yeah it's a nice template yeah it's a shortcut particularly if you're writing a short story and you don't have a lot of room for your setup gets you to the quick and i've just realized that they tell the story in buffy the vampire Slayer. it ends with the exact same scene of them opening the door to no one there so yeah if you've watched genre tv or read short stories i'm sure you've probably seen this story before but it is a good one it's a sign of a good story if it's just hung around for so long right mm. yeah it's very strange because um, I'll talk a little bit about W. W. Jacobs. He wrote mainly comic fiction. Horror was not his usual go-to to write, but his most famous story is The Monkey's Paw, one of the few stories horror stories he wrote, and he only wrote around twenty of these. He wrote lots of other stories that weren't horror. It's a Robert W. Chambers situation. Where he's kind of yeah, with Chambers, it's his he's remembered for weird fiction when at the time he wrote like a heck ton of romances. You think it's because if you're going out of your genre so strongly, and what you normally feel compelled to write, it has to be because you've had a really strong idea. It does touch on things like, he uses in other stories, like the idea of a, a man coming back from India and um, travel, like the travel thing especially. He wrote a lot about sailors and marinas, so his dad works on the like a shipyard, and that influenced a lot of the things that he wrote about. He is also kind of local-ish. He had family in East Anglia, so we're all in that kind of area. And went on holiday there, and the landscape inspired some of his other work. Um, really? Yeah. We have landscapes? Yeah. Yeah. Go out into <laughs> Norfolk. <laughs> he was married to a suffragette as well, so he had a little bit of political influence. And I think probably the best thing I found about him is this quote by Michael Sadler, who said Jacobs wrote, Stories of three kinds describing the misadventures of sailor men ashore, celebrating the artful dodger of a slow-witted village, and tales of a macabre. So, I mean, those things are all quite different. I am quite admire that about this guy, that he knew what he liked writing about, and it was these three very different things. <laughs> I think they're, they're all a mood. Yeah. I, I want to read some of his other stories, because he sounds very interesting as a person as well. Like It's said that he was quite shy and reserved in real life, which is... A bit unusual compared to some of the other writers we've looked at who are more of a get high on drugs, drink lots of alcohol types. <laughs> yeah, that is um, a brief bit about W.W. Jacobs. What guy? Uh, all right, unless anyone's got anything else to say, I think we'll end there. Thank you for listening. Please leave a comment on our website, www.shortstoryworkshop.com to let us know what you thought. You can also find all our previous short stories and episodes. Uh, we'll be back next week with maybe something different to another story because Simone's going on holiday and we'll see what we come up with. Alright. So we'll be back next week. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>